I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Hey guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we have with us today Terry Reardon, bat researcher. Welcome, Terry. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, Everyone Steve. should do that now yeah. on the show. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to talk about bats, and mm-hmm. it's your lifelong passion. Um, so, how do we eradicate bats? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you were joking when you said that was your lead question. <laughs> yeah, ma- maybe we we're already doing a really good job. It's interesting um, in Australia, for example. You know, we put a lot of research effort into the, you know, the the bunch of threatened species that occur around Australia, but we and we know that they're threatened, and we know the processes that are threatening those species, but all the species that are generally thought to be least concern and, and common, um, we know nothing about. You know, their populations could have crashed, you know, um, b- by 50% in the last 20 years, and we would not know. And sort of in answer to your question, uh, Joan and I went up to central Australia and saw how the landscapes changed so much there. And, you know, with the arrival of buffalo grass, frequent fires, big old trees that once held hollows for bats, and... Um, uh, have, have gone and will take another, you know, 300 years or something to return to produce hollows. And the monoculture of, of you know, of these grasses, this grass species, you know, probably has changed the insect abundance. So um, I think we do a probably pretty good job just being humans, doing what we do. Uh, it's probably reduced the bat, bat numbers, I think. Yeah, I'm obviously joking, by the way. Um, but <laughs> um, didn't look like it. it didn't. <laughs> but they have been vilified bats. But we'll come back to that. But it's interesting. You mentioned the buffalo grass. We had John Reed on the show, and he talked about the buffalo grass causes such hot, and the the fire gets so high, it takes out tree mm. hollows. So it's mm. really changing the landscape. Mm. So are many many of our bat species hollow dependent. Yeah, it's a good question because I think most people think of bats as being cave dwelling. So about twenty five percent of Australia's bats are cave dwellers. Um, and the rest are tree hollow dwelling, although there's some odd bats that, uh, like the golden chip bat that likes to roost in uh, hanging nests from um, scrub wrens and whatever. And some species, like a com- very common bat around, will be flying around your place tonight, which is the chocolate wattle bat, seems to live in tree hollows here in, in this part of the world, but you go out to the Nullarbor Plain where the really big caves are, and you know they form really large colonies. You know, it's maybe thousand, two thousand bats. So they're a cave dweller out there. I guess in Nullarbor there's no trees and no hollows, but they seem to adapt to, to both uh, roosting sites. Mm. So they have been vilified bats, haven't they? That's it's it's a thing that people are, in a lot of a lot of countries they're scared of. They think that mm. they're going to cause disease, mm. um, and that's not untrue. But it's also Unlikely, is that fair to say? Uh, I, look, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? In China, they're symbols of good luck. Okay. So, uh, you know, there's whatever, nearly two billion people or something that can, don't vilify them. A lot of people, they're part of their culture, they're part of their food in in, in various countries. They're not sort of vilified. Um, but, you know, of course, we have a history of vampire movies and Dracula and all that sort of stuff, which almost certainly taints, you know, our Western view of it all. So I think, and I think it's about being afraid, you know, like I think it's something we don't, you know, most people don't really see bats close up. Um, and that's one of the amazing things for me to show people bats close up and they almost universally change their opinion once they see them. Um, but um, I think just people are, are afraid because they don't know it's it's something and it's nighttime thing. So I think, you know, I don't know if they're sort of vilified, but I think it's... M- you know, in some cases, like the flying foxes are a, a huge issue along the east coast and all, all around Australia, where flying foxes occur in large numbers, there's a, a a conflict between humans and and flying foxes. So they're certainly vilified. But I think the micro bats, which you know, and maybe we need to go back a bit about that bat world. Um, so um, they're about of you know of the about. I don't know, five and a half thousand species of mammals in the world. Bats make up about 1,400 species. So bats are, you know, around about 22% of all the species diversity of mammals in the world. And the same, in a, and only rodents are a bigger group. So uh, bat, uh, rodents make about a quarter of all the species diversity of mammals in the world. 
we th tend to think of Australia as the land of the marsupial, so we've got about 400 species of land mammals and about half are marsupials, but a quarter, nearly a quarter are bats and nearly a quarter are rodents. So these bats, like the, the native rodents, um, are just as native as kangaroos and koalas. Um, but people don't know that, you know, and I was just talking to my sister, and I hope she won't mind me saying this. I, I, I mean, she's not a biologist, but she lives down in southern Tasmania, and she's passionate about all the animals that, that come in. You know, she has uh, native cats digging under her house and, you know, uh, wallabies and whatever. Um, Fine, and then she had a rat come in, and she thought it might be... Um, yeah, you know, she wasn't sure if it was a native rat or not, and we we started talking about rats, and and she was you know completely unaware that you know like you know the core of our native mammals were rodents, you know. We'd, and I think that's just most people. Most people don't know anything about really the diversity of anything really, you know, whether it's you know uh, Steve, your passion and in in, uh, in in snakes and whatever, you know. We most people don't have any knowledge at all. So when we talk to people, you know, we we assume that they have very little knowledge and I think that's that's the sad thing I think and what you guys do is presenting you know these animals to show people just in genders you know at least some knowledge and hopefully some passion so um yeah so I may have gone off at a tangent there somewhere but so that's what it's all about here no, not at all, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know so there's quite a diversity of bats in Australia so you know a quarter of our native mammals are bats and they're but most people would never know because you mm. you I mean, I know you probably see them all the time because you work with them, and mm. if you go out on dusk and look up, you've got a very good chance of seeing one, but most people wouldn't know, and you wouldn't know that they're out and about and doing all the things mm. they do. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, the I don't know, I guess must be more than half of Australia's population live along the east coast of, and across northern Australia are very familiar with flying foxes. They're very visible. They're often diurnal. You see them, but... Um, uh, yeah, absolutely right. If you go out in just about everywhere in Australia on a warm summer's night and just after sundown, look out to the west and, and you'll see little bats, you know, shooting around. You, If you've got good hearing, um, some bats that come, their echolocation comes into the audible range and it sounds like two 20-cent pieces being tink together. Going, tink, tink, tink. When I was growing up, I always thought they were some sort of insect or something or other. But you know, it's it's quite a large bat. You know, like it's almost um, I don't know what a forty centimeters wingspan and you know, you know, one hundred and fifty mil long, hundred mil long body. It's quite a large bat, but it's one of the most common bats in Australia, and it's you, you hear it universally. Is that called the striped mastiff or something? Yeah, the white striped free tail bat, which is it's got um, this free tail bat has a little tail that sticks out of the tail membrane. Has long narrow wings and it's got this beautiful chocolate velvet brown, um, dark brown body fur. It's fantastic. But you open up the wing and look on the junction of the wing and the body, and it's got this beautiful white stripe. And you know, some individuals we've caught up in the Flinders Range also have this really nice white badge. It's almost like a, a footy jumper sort of thing. Beautiful, beautiful. It's a fantastic bat and big bat with massive teeth. Uh, and when we're catch, you know, doing research on bats, catching them, you know, you catch these things, and they're just the most fantastic animals. Yeah, they're just really placid, you know, just to hold and whatever. Yeah, awesome. But you, but you're right, you know, there uh, we've got in Adelaide uh, maybe eight species flying around the Adelaide Hills, and probably six relatively common in the uh, uh, city. And uh, we've had students in the past. Uh, doing work on looking at the bats in the city and we know that they're relatively common around parkland so people can see them and of course <clears throat> they roost in um, a lot of buildings now so I, every year I get uh, calls from people saying oh, I've got bats in my roof how to get rid of them and maybe we can go into that that process a bit later but um, I think it was in one of the pubs in town was it Talbot or one of the, I can't remember the name of the pub but there was white striped free tail bats roosting in the roof of the of the pub and um, my colleague who was doing that research was sitting out in the beer garden watching holding a bat detector and that was her research <laughs> research site sort of thing way to go I think <laughs> with the bat detectors um, so that pick that that can read the ultrasonic sounds the bats make yeah. mm. so that's that's how you can do a bat survey without having to physically touch a bat yeah exactly so um, 
Yeah, so um, flying foxes, uh, lots larger bats, and they've got some relative smaller bats called blossom bats uh, that occur up on the east coast and across northern Australia. The tiny little bats that, when you catch them, you put out a spoon with sugar in it, and their tongues come out about twice the length of their head and <laughs> lap, lap the sugar. But, so they don't echolocate, so they rely on their sense of smell and excellent night vision. So most of the bats are insectivorous bats, and they use the ones that use echolocation. Uh, and they use that echolocation to navigate through obstacles and find their insect prey. They're mostly insect eating. And uh, I'd like to talk some, about some research on, on their diet in a minute. But um, So, um, yeah, so they call out this sound, but they also have eyes. So when you, that's, I think that's one of the things that surprise people when you show them a bat, an echolocating bat. They've <laughs> got these little eyes like m- mice, and they Blind, see quite well. Yeah, so blinded bats, not true. <laughs> and they've got excellent black and white vision, and we think that's for you know larger scale navigation. So often you'll see bats flying down roads or rivers and things. Um, so their call... Uh, so it, echolocation is an amazing subject, and, um, and it's difficult to describe without seeing some pictures of what the, the calls look like, but if I can d- describe it this way. So... We were talking about the white striped free bat, which has a call which is at about 10 kilohertz. So humans generally can hear, say, up to 20 kilohertz. So 10 kilohertz is within our range, except like me, as you get older, your upper hearing goes. So I haven't been able to hear white striped bats for, you know, 10 years or more. But young kids can hear that, hear them really easily. So that they fly around, they call out this call at uh, 10 kilohertz. And if you see the shape of the call, and I'll mimic it by whistling, it would sound like, would like, like be like this. <whistles> Relatively monotone, flat calls, and every second. And what that tells you is that they're putting all their energy in one frequency band. They're, they're waiting long distances between pulses to get the echoes back. And essentially they're finding insects. They're not very manoeuvrable in their flight. They've got long, narrow wings. And they're chasing insects and catch them on the wing um, uh, by intercepting them and uh, uh, and then you get and I mentioned before the chocolate water bat which is a common bat around here which has a, a, a call which the bottom of the, the loudest part of their frequency is around 50 kilohertz so five mm-hmm. times way above our human hearing but if you could hear see the shape of the call it would call from about 70 kilohertz down to 50 so and very fast Right, so and you can tell about what the bat's doing and pretty much where it's foraging because that. So, bats with low pulse rates are flying above the tree canopy. Um, these things with fast rates, obviously dodge, dodging um, vegetation, and they're chasing insects that are moving all the time. So they want the information back really quick. So they're picking up really short space, and there's a relationship between the frequency and the size of the insect that they're chasing. So. Lower frequency is bigger wavelengths, so they're picking up bigger insects, whereas you know really high frequency is picking up smaller insects. So, yeah, so they're shouting at these sounds, and even though they're above human hearing, they're um, very loud sounds. So they're you know the order of 120 dB. You know, like in my day, my day, Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin would be the loudest concerts at around about 120 dB or something or other. So we had, we had a dB meter when I did music. And oh, really? I'd smash my snare drum, and that was over 100 dB, just yeah. one snare drum, let alone a whole band. Mm. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, these bats are calling, you know, these tiny little things, you know. So now I'm talking um, little chocolate waddle bats, you know, their body size not much bigger than a mouse and a wingspan maybe, I don't know, 200 millimetres or something or other, six inches or something. Um, so these tiny little animals are just shouting out this enormous amount of sound. <laughs> now, if you shout the sound out, you, and if I, t- you can't hear much else that's going on if you're shouting mm. at this loud sound so they decouple their bone from their eardrum so they they can shout and not get that noise traveling through their head and of course then they've got to wait for an echo and now they've got to shout out loud sound because you know that sound dissipates to the square of the distance so it gets like as you double the distance it halves and then by the square of that so twice the distance is four times less sound. So it radiates like that. By the time it picks up an insect, little, and then the insect echo comes back to the bat, you know, there's very faint sound. So that's why it has to be 
really loud. But the thing is that sound, the higher frequency you go, it dissipates in the air really quickly. So that means that um, high pitch sound gets what's called attenuated, just dissolves much more quickly in the air, whereas low sound travels much further. So when we have, so we have these, you know, in the last, when I started out, um, we didn't have bat detectors, but the technology has gone amazing and become amazing in the last um, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, where you've got these handheld detectors or things that you stick on in front of your your uh, phone or your um, iPad or whatever, and fantastic microphones that uh, then show on your screen the shape of the call and you can record the call and do analysis. So we can actually walk around with a bat detector and see what bats are flying around. You guys should have a bat detector here and we, sh- we need to know what's happening on this property. Yeah, that's great. That'd be great. And they're probably drinking over your little little dam there as well at night. So now you have detectors that you can just leave out for, you know, a month or something or other, and it just records the calls in small chunks onto an SD card, and then you come back and then you go through the calls and identify them all, and you can see what's going on. And there's been a lot of work done now trying to automate this this process. So uh, in the old days, you know, you you record, you know, a couple hundred thousand calls. You have to go through every file and look at it and identify it it's really slow and increasingly there's been better algorithms and ways of doing things and but thus far we the ultimate automated back to back call and analyzer hasn't been developed yet but i've been talking to people recently and they're using <coughs> convoluted uh, convoluted neural network te- um, algorithms to actually develop automated keys for bats now so i'm really hopeful that soon we'll have you know, be able to identify most bat species. And the, the reason, and just to go back, just one step there is that I talked about two extremes, the white striped bat down at 10 kilohertz and the um, chocolate wattle bat at 50 kilohertz. There's a lot of common bats around here, little forest bats that are really tiny, but they call, you know, roughly in this, they're about the same size. They call, you know, around between 40 and 45 kilohertz and the shape of their calls are pretty much the same. And through Doppler, you can get shifts of um, um, a couple of kilohertz. So they're very difficult to tell apart. So you get you might have these three species flying around here, and it's really hard to tell them apart. Um, so that, that's one of the big challenges for uh, call analysis. But it's changed the way we survey for that. It's, it's an amazing technology. Has all this new technology um, allowed you to recognise new species and... And yeah, I would imagine, like, if we can't mm. hear them. Then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. So um, I guess historically the way all this worked, you know, in fact, we did some work up in Cape York um, uh, in 2009. We were asked, because I think um, I think at least half the micro bat species up there were on the threatened species lift or something rather. And so we had a job to go and sort of work out, you know, what you know, what is this, what do we think the status of all these bats are? So we went, we went up to the top of Cape York from Cairns and worked our way back down, did a different, went for 30 days and did 30 different sites, put out stacks of bat detectors, caught lots and lots of bats and um, developed a, um, you know, worked out what's there. Um, and so we, we had a pretty good idea of, of the species diversity and there's, there's a couple of bats called uh, horseshoe bats that have these amazing faces, you know, they've got this, instead of shouting out their sound, they hum it through these leaves on their this uh, like skin leaves on their face in the shape of a horseshoe and they've got these little p- fleshy protuberances and really unique looking bat and there's a couple of three species on Cape York and they've got constant frequency calls so they instead of doing or they got very flat calls and we can identify the species really easily but recently some people um, uh, in just north I think around Mission Beach on the on Queensland picked up this flat call which was not the same frequency of any others and so they've gone back there and we think this is a new species so so exactly you know what you're suggesting is that there is the possibility you know once we get to know an area so how, how do we know what species I guess this leads on to how do we know what species has what call sort of thing so that's what we spend a lot of time in so we go out and catch bats and we do that using very fine mist nets um, and um, can you remind me to come back to Cape York 
and shotguns. Uh, <laughs> um, wow. Because <laughs> um, I think where I was going to go there, um, it's going to go about the history of how we, how we know what bats are, but I'll just finish off this about echolocation calls. So no, normally go out with mist nets and, and string them up over waterways or in gaps in the bush, and we have these things called harp traps, which are um, square aluminium frames about two metres by two metres that have these uh, nylon strings about an inch apart vertically strung and two or three or four banks of those and when the bats fly and you put them up on the stand and then when the bats fly into those strings they fall down and they go into a bag and so it's a very good way to catch bats and many species like spider catching bats and a whole lot of other uh, bats which we don't catch in mist nets we catch in these harp traps so we go out and we catch all of these bats and then we identify them and then we get a little uh, you know those siloom sticks little fishing for silent sticks, you know, you break them and they glow in the dark. Mm. So you get these tiny little ones, and then you get a bit of sticky tape and you cut about an inch of that, fold it in half, and then put the the silent stick on the bat's belly and squeeze it between a few strands of belly fur. So we know what the species is because we've identified, and then we let it go and we all run around with our bat detectors and follow it through mm. the forest and record its call. So we do that over and over and again and build up a reference library of calls. Um, so we know what each species is and then we put, put those reference calls into the whatever algorithm we're trying to develop to automatically identify them and then hopefully we can identify the unknowns sort of thing so that's how that works but I'll go back to just Kate York just because um, yeah it's, it's interesting I, when we did this study in 2009 I looked at the old records um, up there and there was all these bats caught that hadn't been caught for a long time and I realised back in the day, people had used shotguns to collect bats. So these bats, like the Papuan sheathtail bat, which is relatively, was thought to be relatively rare, and it's quite a large bat, as big as the white striped free tail bat. And um, all the records for this, you know, and this is a clearly obvious thing, if you had a spotlight, you'd see it and you can easily shoot them. So a lot of, rec a lot of the early records were done with shotguns and, and bird nets, which are really thick. So the very small micro bats don't get caught you know, in the mist nets. And then, you know, that sort of phased out. And then with the invention of um, harp traps, it just completely changed our view, our knowledge of what bats were. All of a sudden we're catching all these different suites of bats. And then the combination of that and bat detectors and all that sort of changed. So the history of, you know, the Cape York bats, you know, it looks like some species were present and, um, and then went extinct or got rare and all these other species... But it's just simply a, a function of the evolution of the way people did did bat work. So <laughs> shooting bats to find them. <laughs> yeah. um, when when you you got megabats and microbats, mm -hmm. but uh, there are some pretty big microbats and some pretty small megabats. Is that true? Yeah, worldwide. So it's a interesting conundrum because. Um, uh, when you know when bat people talk about megabats and microbats, we fully understand what it means. And I got hammered in a recent paper for using those terms because in the old days it was thought that megabats, which is really a family called ter Terapodidae, which has the big flying foxes and a bunch of little uh, blossom bats, and that was a separate evolutionary line to all, all the echolocating bats. And genetic work done, um, oh, I guess it must be 15 years ago now, but repeated since have shown that the microbats, the echolocating bats, are in two groups now, and the um, um, megabats are in one of those groups. And I just saw recently a, a phylogenetic tree that suggested that the ancestors of, of bats, which you know probably 55 million years old, so the old fossils from Wyoming and from southeast Queensland and India were found around about 52 million years ago seem to have the apparatus for echolocation so bats probably evolved you know sometime 55 60 million years i'm not sure but it seems like the oldest bats have echolocation and then these branch two branches happen and then maybe uh, the the mega bats lost echolocation so when we talk about so now the purists don't like to talk about mega bats and micro bats because this group now is called Yintero Corruptor, and this is the Yango Corruptor of this, this group. This group. So we, but everybody knows what we do when we're talking about mega and micro bats, essentially. But you're quite right. Mega bats have 
quite small blossom bats. Um, is a tube nose bat a blossom tube bat? bat is, yeah. A, a, is, yeah, we well, have one of those ex- outside mm. of our rooms in Borneo. Yeah. Oh, fab- yeah. fabulous, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Well, I thought that was a fruit bat. Well, it's, well it, it is. A, it is a fruit, oh, it is a fruit yeah. bat. Sorry. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. It's a mega. Mm. It's, a mega it's in the bat. it's in the it's mega bat, <laughs> and the biggest. In fact, the biggest um, micro bat. Um, well, there's two. There's one Australia's ghost bat, but there's another one in Borneo called the naked free tail bat, which is this huge thing, just no fur whatsoever. Of course, it occurs in Borneo, but Australia's got the most fantastic um, ghost bats. I undoubtedly, you've seen them. In zoos and in zoos yeah. always have the ghost bats, don't they? Yeah, mm. gorge but, have them with their buildings. Mm. I don't know if they still do. So the, the big um, fruit bats don't have echolocation. No, mm. Mm. even the little fruit bats don't have echolocation. Even the little. What about ones the don't. medium ones? <laughs> they do. No. Oh, they do. <laughs> and again, it's not strictly true because there's things called barebacks fruit bats. But so we've got uh, one species in Australia, and there's several species through New Guinea uh, live in caves, and they've got this. Um, a click, which is an echolocation, but it's not echolocation, it's just a click. And it's like the, I don't know if you've seen those, um, what do you call those, cave swiftlets up in Chiligo and places like yeah. in a lot of places, you know, they have this little audible click. Here in Borneo yeah. too. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yep. Mm. There's yeah, some rodents that do a bit of echolocating. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, that's right. I think the so bandicoots also have a high pitched. It's not really? like it sound. I'm not sure. Oh, know that. Don't yeah. quote me on that one. It's too no, late. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I was, uh, maybe somebody did. Somebody tell me hips are primed on. Oh, okay. The musky made, rat kangaroo. Yeah, made, That's interesting. Yeah. Um, there are people that go blind and they can do clicks out the click. window and, that, and they they can see the buildings and things, can't they? They start to they go. Does the echo location does that go to the optical part of a bat's brain, or do we have any idea? Or? I guess it goes to the audible. So, the audible side because okay. they do or have eyes and they have vision anyway which is yeah okay is that so, not, sorry is that a comic thing that you've just said there that what? people can put their head to a blind can put their heads out the window click no that's true and see a building that's true is it no blind, I, yeah. I, I think he's pulling I think your he's reading to, something there yeah. and there was no an, an actual because <laughs> I want to see an the actual giant giant here boy. come yep I saw it yep yeah Jane saw it yeah, yeah. something must be happened true. must be true yeah uh, actually when, when uh, did you see uh, it when uh, you were clicking yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> there's, there's a bicycle and clicks there's a guy there's a guy who travels the world lecturing on this he's blind what? and he 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 does these clicks and he can tell you the shape of stairs and buildings and stuff like that it's it's just amazing that's insane wow and we had it's a crazy the that? museum yeah. had a great program we we went down and um, Talk, did a program on bats for the South Australian School for Vision Impaired Kids and we took them to the Flying Fox Colony and we went out at night and had bat detectors and whatever. But he'd been, I think he'd been to that school, you know, and that, they're all cue, cued into this guy because there's various people that do this at various levels. But this guy just happens to have it perfected it, you know, to actually see the shape. And he rides, as Joan's saying, ride bikes and whatever. And you can, it's, if you... Want to look it up? YouTube, echolocating people or something like that. It's, yeah, it's well, amazing. It's, it's pretty weird, isn't it? Um, so bats do a lot of really good stuff. I mean, what comes to mind is: Do you drink tequila? Do you like tequila, Terry? Uh, tequila. <laughs> what? Tequila. <laughs> Occasionally. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm told that we wouldn't have tequila if it wasn't for bats. Hmm. So yeah, so there's a whole bunch of. Bats, particularly in in the Americas, that have. What's the matter with you today? <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested now. Yeah. I like tequila. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so there's a whole bunch of bats that um, are in uh, are, are echolocating bats in the uh, Amer- South Southern America, um, Central America, and South America that uh, yeah you know, pollinate cactus and a whole lot of things. So they're using echolocations in the same way as chasing insects but they're nocturnal and they are attracted to the um you know night flowers and they're just yeah just an amazing co-evolution that you know you've seen all those you know pictures of the way insects and flowers co-evolve to, to look like one another and um and oh and my favorite so, yeah so there's a whole so you're right so there's a whole bunch of uh bats that pollinate flowers um, that are in the insectivorous group that are different than the blossom bats which also pollinate 
uh, flowers. And that, yeah, it's fantastic photographs of our pollinating bats. You know, um, you know, putting their head in a in, inside a plant, licking out the nectar at the base of the thing and the stamen, sort of hitting and filling up their head full of <laughs> pollen, and they fly onto the next one and pollinate it. Because things like bananas, um, the agave, where we make tequila, and is there anything like Australian, uniquely Australian? Like boab trees. Boab apparently. trees, yeah. yeah. So our little uh, northern blossom bats are pollinate, yeah, pollen boab trees. And I don't, yeah, I, don't, I really don't know a lot about the the diet and what um, I've seen in New Guinea. Like uh, what are they call Sazigium? Is that lily pillies? Yep. Um, yeah, they're on those those trees. Yeah. Does that mean those guys flower at night time? But yeah, well yeah. they open at night. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so the insect eating bats, they save us billions of dollars, don't they? Yeah. So, well, there was a, you know the classic study that we all quote, and I, I never get, I never quite remember because it was a range, I think. But in America, that they they thought that um, the insectivorous bats in the US contributed something like three billion dollars to the agroforestry economy. Um, so. You know, when you think about it, like all these, you know, at night, millions of these bats are flying around at night eating all these insects. So they're really important for insect um, regulation. So that's important for they're eating things like mosquitoes and whatever. So that's important controlling insects that may, you know, cause human and animal disease. Um, and also uh, eating. So we have had a student. Um, recently from Adelaide University, Joanne Kuhn, who did a study down at the Bat Cave at Narracourt. Um, and what, what we did was we put all these plastic sheets in the cave, in a couple of caves for overnight. And when the bats, you know, this bat colony has 30,000 bats in it, so they came in, they do droppings on the sheets. And she went in and carefully picked up all the individual fresh droppings. And, and some other colleagues in Victoria got some you know, cave floor droppings and whatever, and she did, used environmental DNA to look at the diet of these bats because we don't really know. And that's one thing we don't know about most of our bats in Australia is what their diet is. Mm. So we know that they're in, in, insect eating, but we don't know what key insects are, are important. And if we want to look after them, and particularly the bent wing bat down at Narracourt, which is a critically endangered species, we need to know what its diet is so we can provide, you know, the habitat that provides that food item. So when she did her uh, environmental DNA analysis on the dropping, she found that they, she discovered there were 67 species of moths in the diet, mm. and which is quite a diversity for one night, you know, in this in southern Australia. And I think it was 13 of those were uh, known as crop pests. So these bats are out there, you know, cleaning up all these important crop pests. And so things like um, we, we do know that the chocolate wattle bat that's common around here is a moth specialist. So, you know, we don't know what the contribution to our, you know, like our apple growing orchard is, you know, when they're eating, um, you know, light brown apple moth and codlin moth and whatever. But, you know, they're important, you know, from that that point of view. So they, they people always ask, you know, you know, oh, why are bat, bats important to us? Well, they are in a sense, you know, they should be important because they, are, they just exist. But, you know, they do have a role you know, in our health and our food production and whatever. And they're doing it, this big bi- biological service, with diminished numbers too because mm. their numbers are like a lot of... Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> there would have once been a lot more. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, do you guys know James Smith? Do yes, you know Smith? Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I had dinner with him um, late last year and he's building a new house. And he's putting a section of his roof. Do you know about this? Yeah, yeah, I've been involved with it. Have from, you? From oh, the right, go. there yeah. you go. Yeah. It's four yeah. bats, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. People are kind of ringing you saying, how do I get the bats out of my roof? He's trying to build his roof to facilitate so bats. bats <laughs> so I think in, in most cases, you know, I get calls and people are, uh, you know, you talk to them and they, it, a, a lot of, you know, I'd say most of the people uh, are happy to leave the bats there once you talk to them and, you know, because they're a bit worried about diseases. You know, this is a common and I should have mentioned, when you asked me about vilification, I think it's the d- the disease side of it's another aspect why people are a bit frightened of bats. But and vampires, too, to be fair. And vampires, yeah. yeah. it's the other one. Dracula. Yeah. But, um, yeah, lost track then. Sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, so you're talking about James Smith's... Um, it's bat roof. Bat okay. roof, yeah. So most people are happy to leave them there once they know, you know, that they're, you know, it's not going to affect them or whatever. Um, or, you know, there's pretty simple solutions like, you know, putting a shade cloth above your BMW or something so they don't poo on their, <laughs> on their car. But, you know, in some cases, you know, they've got legit reasons to get, get rid of them. You know, like they're redoing the roof or whatever. So, you know, there's strategies for, and, you know, and James, I think, is on top of this as well, about the way you can, st- you know, uh, it, generally what you do with, with houses, for example, is, um, you know, work out where the bats are flying in and out. And then in, in uh, February, March, when the weather's still warm and the young are born and have left... Uh, you know, uh, uh, independently flying, then you gradually sort of block up all the holes until that point, and then you can put a little rubber flap or just block it up on a really warm night when they've all gone out, and mm. it seems to work. But, a bit like uh, possums, one way door. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's out. it. Mm. With the uh, with the insect bat, something that we have spoken about a few times on on podcasts. Um, you're driving around at night nowadays, like even in Northern Territory, and you don't get many insects. It used to be impossible to keep your windscreen clean mm. and things like that. Like nowadays, there's just not as many insects around. Is that affecting mm. bats? Is that a so? There's problem? been yeah, there's been a fair, a bit in the literature in the last you know four or five years about the diminishing number of insect numbers and diversity in in Europe and I think in America. I'm not so I haven't seen that much here. It's, I haven't been aware of it. But, yeah, I, you know, I mean, I think about, you know, when I was a kid and you turn your front porch light on and there was moths everywhere on the mm. thing. Now, I don't really know whether, you know, that's my memory of a night when it was, you know, a warm night and there was about to rain and, and we're all the moths came. we're going to remember those nights. Yeah, we're going to remember yeah. those nights. Mm. So it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit of a that memory. And But I noticed, you know, we have live in the hills and there don't seem to be that many moths coming to the... You know, to the the glass door when the house lights are on, that that sort of thing, and and people often talk about you know the, and I don't know if that's because cars have got slopy back windows now and they don't hit the the, the windscreen as often or or not, but uh, yeah, I th- I think there's a general consensus that there's that's yeah, I think even when you're driving along with be... your headlights on, mm. you just don't see all the yeah. insects that you mm. or but that I remember. Mm. Um, when I was a kid. Yeah, and it's, you know, you think about our country, it's a huge change to all the vegetation and, you know, often places, you know, there's, you know, vineyards from, you know, we've got us, have had it some looking at, you know, we've been involved with a, a Wildlife for Wine recently and looking at how bats, we might be able to get uh, vineyards, people to get, put more bat boxes up to attract uh, insects to control vineyard pests but Alyssa Sparrow was talking to me about that yeah so she you know kind of got me in roped in on for the bat side of that yeah but um you know but you know you look at areas you know there's just you know vineyards from horizon to horizon or there's agroforestry from horizon to horizon and then you know the change in landscapes in the outback through grazing and clearance and whatever I, and then you know they had and in, in the 70s in the US, there was a study done where they looked at um, the imp- impact of DDT, and I think there was a cave there that had something like 20 billion bats, 20 million bats in it, and the introduction of DDT, that population dropped to about 200,000 or something yeah. like that. And then when DDT was finally phased out, these bat populations increased, and it was because the organochlorines sort of built up, you know, in their fat, and these are migratory species, so when they started migrating again, they were mobilising all the fat and then they would would die. So I think it's a combination of a whole lot of, you know, change in, you know, like pesticides. We found pesticides, for example, down in Bat Cave at Narracourt. Um, in the faeces? Yeah, and yeah, we, we right. actually looked at, you know, in the blood as well and um, and we found, you know, like traces of um, DDT metabolites. Well, it's probably ubiquitous, you know, if we looked in human mother's milk now we'd probably still find DDT metabolites still lingering they're very you know long lived uh, things but coming through the soil still today yeah yeah right wow and going you know into the plants and then the insects and then we found a thing called methamidophos which was none of us had heard of and we looked up uh, and it was a miticide for in, used in potato crops this was in, in Bat Cave at Narracourt and I thought oh well that's weird there's no potatoes down here but out of my ignorance there were a huge pivot you know, growth areas of potatoes. So 
somehow you know it's got up through the the chain and into the bats now i don't know whether that affected the bats or or not but it, it was a detected in our assay but we do know that things like organochlorines and organophosphates and those sorts of things that were commonly used in ddt you know a lot in the other hills say piccadilly and whatever you know 40 50 60 years ago or so you know would have been around and probably would have killed a lot of bats i imagine now you've had a walk around my property here it's just three acres of remnant stringy bark woodland do you reckon there's bats living here there's a lot of tree hollows do you think there's any any bats yeah if there's tree hollows there's a good chance um that there will be bats living there i don't yeah it's always hard to know um but they all we all have bats flying over here so you know if you were to put out a bat detector at night you'd hear bats flying over and you know, i'd be surprised here if you didn't pick up you know at least seven species and and as i said i'll bet they they will come and drink out of your little pond there on really hot nights so. i do hear the one you mentioned that the striped free white, tail the white striped, white striped free tail mm-hmm. yeah the 220 cent piece i do hear that one and we see fruit bats on dust too they're, they're massive they've got like a one meter wingspan they yeah. fly over like something cruising out of mortar they're mm. ridiculous um have, you're obviously aware of is it the golden crown flying fox it's the um, one in the philippines it's the biggest of the fruit bats well biggest oh, wingspan no, i don't don't know that common name but yeah oh, there's a bat called vamp yeah it's a 1.7 metre wingspan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Listen, you've seen how big the ones here are. The biggest in Australia wingspan-wise is a metre, and that just looks ridiculous. Mm. This thing's like mm. 1.7. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, flying foxes are amazing. I think, you know, like, you, again, you see them, and they're most fantastic faces, and, you know, people have them, you know, look after them, and they're very interactive and curious, and I often tell a story as a, you know, place in New Guinea um, and we went to this cave in the jungle and it was like I don't know maybe the size of three tennis courts or something like this hole and it just dropped you know like nearly 100 feet 30 meters sheer sides and on the walls were um, I don't know 150,000 50,000 something these bareback flying foxes just roosting on the sides of the walls and I remember abseiling into this cave to see if it had tunnels going off and you get to the bottom and of course you sink this far in in bat guano and shit <laughs> and whatever and then of course the bats take off and it was raining urine all over me and I thought that was the best place I'd ever been in my life <laughs> <laughs> bat world mm. wow. do, yeah. do we worry about the fact um, that bats have all of a sudden kind of arrived in Adelaide as well in seems to be one place outside the, the, the zoo. Mm. It's not, it doesn't seem the best place for them in red-hot Adelaide at certain times of year and things. Yeah, it's it's such a vexed issue. You know, like, on one hand, you know, this is a, a, a nationally threatened species, so... And we've known for a long time that that species, the grey-headed flying fox, has moved further and further south. Um, so it's normally distributed from around Rockhampton... Um, down to Sydney or so and it's moved I think in the 1980s it got to Melbourne and then built up colonies much the size we have, uh, even bigger than we have here at the moment and eventually they came here in 2010 like there was one found in the Botanic Gardens and then a woman in Fullerton had uh, she rang up me at the, rang me at the museum said oh I've got all these you know 500, 500 flying foxes in my pencil pine this is in <laughs> Fullerton uh, yeah well uh, and she was insistent you know and I thought there were much micro bats in, in a hollow or something like that. so I went around there and got there a bit early and it was this beautiful pencil pine pristine no noise or anything so we sat around her and drank a bit of wine and then just got dark and all of a sudden 500 flying foxes flew out of the <laughs> pencil pine and then I think Chris Daniels and a whole bunch of and ABC we all went down there next morning and bang tins and shooed them out of her property and then did that for a couple of nights and they disappeared and it turned out that that was a, a, a major food shortage so in that year uh, there, were, there was just hardly any nectar around for those flying foxes in their normal area and so they were flying to a really weird place as they turned up in Tasma- southern Tasmania for the first time there's you know um, wow. emaciated ones on oil rigs on Bass Strait sort of thing and then they they made it to Adelaide and I think what happens is you kind of get this uh, you know I, I don't know how they 
how those animals communicate, but they seem to have some sort of corporate knowledge. So, you know, so those ones that we shoot out in 2010, most went back because it just coincided with the end of the food shortage. So they probably all went back to Melbourne and back up to northern uh, New South Wales, south, southeast Queensland. But then the following years, um, you know, they, the following year there was a small colony, about 30 in the Botanic Gardens. And then because Sydney and Melbourne had spent millions of dollars trying to get rid of theirs from their, you know, having 20 and 50,000 bats or something ruining their trees. You know, it made sense in Adelaide before these bats got habituated to get them out. And so the Department of Environment did a really good job banging lids and moving them gradually out over a month. You know, they'd bash tins and they'd fly to another tree and then they'd fly back in the afternoon and they'd do that next morning at six o'clock. And eventually they'd stay there and then they'd do that again, they'd go to that tree and then eventually got to where they are now. And then the population, you know, at that stage it was around 400 and I understand it's around about 30,000 now. Yeah, it's very vexed, you know. In many ways, they're in, a, in as good a place as they're going to be because there's been a lot of, over the years, calls for culling and calls for moving them. But, you know, every time this dispersals happen, it just puts the problem somewhere else and you don't know where that is. You know, you know I think in, in Melbourne, they spent a lot of money trying to get them out of Melbourne Botanic Gardens and they built this... Uh, well, they identified fired a site on the Yarra and they built these big aviaries and put bats in there to attract all the other bats and eventually shooed them out of botanic gardens but they went somewhere else at Yarra Bend rather than Horseshoe Bend. So you know you you can't send them where you want them to go and we tried finding sites in Adelaide where we thought that might be palatable to have these colonies but so yeah and there's a lot of uh, stakeholders involved with all this because there's been power outages, there's been you know the fruit growers are, are are concerned and I think there's been a couple of plane strikes and whatever and well, the planes have crashed into the bats yeah so that this I guess it's not you know not that happens a lot you know I think in northern Australia and micro bats hit them all the time and birds but um, and as far as I know that's the only three I think they were out at might have been two of them out at Parafield but um, I can't remember the detail but so a lot of people kind of worried. There's a lot of stakeholders involved with this colony. Um, uh, the Botanic Gardens are rightly worried about the impact on their, their gardens and whatever. They're in a place now which is in a really good spot in a way because, you know, the, the trees there aren't, as, you know, aren't their most valuable trees, but definitely the footprint's increasing and they're having an impact on the trees that they're in. And, and I think what happens is that... the you know, and I think it's partly because there's less food available, and maybe the fires may have had a big impact because some of the fires burned out some of the, you know, the big areas of of eucalypts. So they're mainly feeding on eucalypt blossoms. Their preferred diets, eucalypt blossoms, but they will feed on other fruits, native fruits, and then if it, things get desperate, they'll feed on, you know, cultivated fruits. I get them in. I've got a big introduced banks here, just next to my house, yeah. and they come and um, get the nectar from the banks here. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, they're primarily nectivorous, but... Um, and then there's black flying foxes, which are really numerous and occur right across southern Australia, and their numbers are coming further and further down. Oh. So one thing we're thinking about, they might be competing for resources. Um, it's a big, complicated story, but the most reliable, it seems, winter resources in northern Queensland and... Southeast, sorry, northern New South Wales, northeastern New South Wales, and southeastern Queensland, and so essentially they come down south in summer and go back to these places. But now, because of all of our street plantings and you know backyard gardens and fruit, you know they're staying south, you know, and they've got to Adelaide and think, wow, this is a bonanza here, you know. So they're not going back, you know, and so the only real control here is you know those heat wave events when it gets above 42, 43 degrees and mm. depending on when that happens, if it happens in early January it can wipe out the entire reproductive output all the young die. If yeah. it happens later then it's less young die but some more adults seem to, to be affected by it. Wayne and Katrina end up with hundreds of them and yeah. rehabilitating yeah. them, don't they? Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge and it's a shocking thing to go there. It, you know, you it's just the smell of all these dead bats and they're lying around on streets and whatever. So the whole lot of us go in there and, you know, take bags and pull up all these dead bats. You know, it's a pretty shocking thing. But these volunteers are, you know, you know you're, 
been talking today about the wonderful volunteers you have here on this property and I think of all those fauna carers and other people that come in and volunteer and do that really distressing job so other people don't have to actually contend with it. You know, and the City Council's been amazing and the Botanic Gardens have been really helpful. Well, that's amazing. That's only 2010. That's when I moved to Australia. I thought they'd been there for a lot longer than that, so it's very recent. Yeah, so that's when they've arrived. So there's been odd records. So the first record I'm aware of was 1998 down and there was uh, about 10 of them in an apple tree down at Mount Gambier. So I went down to see those. And um, then there's been single records in Adelaide, a uh, couple of electrocutions, and uh, a, a ranger saw one out at the Gauna Wetlands, um, but only those odd, odd records. And then, yeah, and then 2010, the food shortage was what brought wow. a bunch here. So. There's been I could of... add something about that. There was a 10-year drought, which ended in 2010, and, but there was a big bushfire in the Dandenongs in Victoria, which might have caused them to move westward. Move over at that point. For, there was no food. Mm. Um, Terry's partner Jane in the background. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, no, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Can't remember um, you jumping in on so, yeah. Jane's podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was terrible. Like he, had it, he had it coming. He had it coming. Um, there was talk about putting overhead sprinklers there for yeah, the population. That, yeah, I think that. Yeah, they there have. was a bit of fun. They have a bit of funding made available for that. Um, I think. Yeah, and there was a bit of concern because uh, they were worried about was it elm rust, I think, um, for having moisture in the trees. But um, eventually, I think they put it up. But I think there's, there's been a couple of couple of issues. Um, uh, yeah, I don't really know a lot about you know how it's how it's going. But I think because they've got standing water and and there's really tall pipes that they have yeah. to drain out. If you leave it in there, it kind of gets. Well, it makes noise when it goes up, but if you leave it in there, you, I guess you can get um, fungal growth or whatever. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I haven't caught up with th those guys um, about that. Mm. Last, year last time so. I went down there, yeah, there was the big pipes going up to the mm. trees. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm. Um, it was interesting you said that the fruit bats evolved from some micro bat way back in the Paleocene. Mm. Um, because I remember hearing decades ago people thought they were almost evolved convergently and that the fruit bats evolved from lemurs. Mm. Was, that, was that ever a thing? Did I dream that? No, you didn't dream it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, it's, yeah, like, I think, um, I think for, for most, of them, you know, most, of the, most of the time up until, was that 1990s, I think we thought there was a single origin. There was a guy... Jack Pettigrew in Queensland, who's a fat, amazing guy, he reevaluated. I think he he noticed that the visual pathway from the eye to the brain was unique in flying foxes that were more like primates than it were like other bats. And so he proposed this diphyolytic, or two separate origins for these two groups of bats. And then, then a whole lot of people published uh, genetic stuff and showed no, no, you know they're come from a single ancestor and then he reanalyzed all their data and and challenged it because they had you know base you know base biases in their dna and all that but then subsequently there's you know enormous amount of sequencing done and, and so that the dual origin is <clears throat> as uh, you know it's been pretty refuted and the interesting thing is that some of the mammalian trees because it's interesting looking at the various changes of mammalian evolution and all the relationships because for a long time bats you know i started off bats who i thought were close more closely related to shrews than anything else that that lineage but now it's you know part of the horses and rhinos as they're one of their closest relatives you know thank god wow. the rhinos don't have wings and <laughs> so, imagine the size of those wings yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pegasus <laughs> wow what got you into bats? How come? How come you into bats? Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because <laughs> I was asking you guys earlier a bit about you know how you get started, and it's and it's often you know I, I don't know how how you get started. I, I remember at school, kind of at least no formal education, but interested in looking up rocks. And I used to sell skinks at school for thruppence and stuff like that, <laughs> and catch zebra finches. And so it was 
part of that. So you were a poacher. Poacher. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm joking. But, <clears throat> yeah, and then at some at some stage um, we got involved with uh, you know bushwalking and caving, and I became pretty. Yeah, you know, I, I was consumed by caving, cave diving for many years, and and then we went into a cave once, and there was a bat on the wall, and the guy said, "Oh, don't let it bite you; you'll get histoplasmosis." And I said, "What's that?" And he said, "Oh, it's a disease, you know." Um, anyway, so I went back and looked it up. Uh, I was working at the weight as a technician at that stage, and <clears throat> I looked it up, and I said, "Oh, hex histoplasmosis is actually a fungal disease. You can only get it from it grows in the gua- you know the guano on the floor and." If you breathe in the spores, you know, you can get lung disease. Not, um, And people die, people who mine guano for fertiliser and, and for gunpowder, uh, who get huge challenges can easily die of it. So I thought, well, nobody's done any work on bat, bat-wing bats at Narricot. I'll go and do, collect some samples and get a mycologist to look and see if we've got histo there. And um, uh, Anyway, so uh, then I was actually running a, uh, going on a diving trip to the Nullarbor and then... I uh, went to the museum and asked the guy, and I'd learned a little bit about bats at this, not much. I went to the museum and asked the guy there, did anybody want any bats? I'm going to the Nullarbor, you know. And uh, he said, oh, we don't, but go out and see these guys out at Gillis Plains. doing. They've just got a grant to look at the taxonomy of Australian bats. So I went out there and, and eventually they signed me up to go on a six-month field trip around Australia collecting tissues for bats, and, and then I did that. For the second year, did it was a three-year grant, so I did that for six months, and then another six months, and and then I went to Tassie for three months. So and then we published, and then they gave me a job, um, and we published uh, all this using genetic techniques, which became in vogue then. It was all not DNA, but protein electrophoresis, and we showed that all these bat species, like what well, some of the, these little forest bats I was telling you about before, which you know, right in the very beginning was thought to be one species in Australia and then some people did some, uh, looked at the morphology of them and said there was four species and then we did the genes and it showed that there were 11, uh, nine species in Australia. And so, um, yeah, and a whole lot of bats, bat groups we did the genetics on and published those and showing that there were lots of different species. And, and um, yeah, so I got a job and, you know, and then I worked in that, genetics lab which is a wonderful thing because we worked I worked for other guys who were doing working on fish and bacteria I published stuff on I don't know um, bacteria and fungi and whatever it's really good but bats always kind of a passion and it's one of those things you kind of get a little bit of knowledge and then so after those field trips you know I learned a bit but I didn't know that much and I thought I'd write a little book on bats not really knowing that much and and then just about a lot of the people that were old, a lot older and had expertise passed away and then I became the expert, not knowing much at all. So you look up stuff and you gradually accumulate some knowledge and then, you know. But in one of the really neat things for me, one of the best things for me is being as part of a group that sort of set up the Australasian Bat Society, <clears throat> which has now grown to, I think, 700 members. And there was, you know, there were a bunch of bat researchers back in you know, in the early 80s. And now there's bat research going on all over Australia and, you know, I feel really proud to be involved with that society because it was very inclusive. We brought in everybody and, you know, all these fantastic students now and researchers doing really, really nifty stuff, you know. Um, This project we've just done at Narricourt had a PhD student. We put kit tags inside 3,000 bats and we've got these big loop antennas inside the cave and when the bats fly through it records every bat. So for four years we had you know 3,000 bats you know flying through, we've got their daily movements and completely reshaped our our prior understanding of their seasonal cycles and how they all, all work you know. So this combination of new students and technologies and this overarching body you know which and the conferences are always great it's just just finished one now last this week um um you know i think you know bat research is really healthy in australia you know there's a lot of people you know and i think you probably see it across a lot of the disciplines i think then yeah um yeah i feel feel like the research side of it's really healthy but still so much to learn so much we don't know and um yeah and then this ever prep pressing thing of worrying about the 
future, you know, future of all of our animals, not only bats, but everything. You know, it's still kind of what you, drives you, I guess. Hmm. Do they have any any predators? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, there will be uh, predators for bats. So, you know, bats live in tree hollows. Often live in low hollows. So, you know, you often see snakes, and goannas, um, pick them up occasionally. Uh, we talked uh, earlier before this interview about Graham Medlin, who's it's the most amazing guy. Does all the owl pellet stuff, but and he finds finds bats in there in some of the owl pellets. But it's a pretty low proportion of all other parts of their diet, so we don't think they eat a lot of bats. Um, so yeah, so I don't. Yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine what predators would be in some of the caves and whatever. I mean, we see down at Narricourt the occasional. Uh, possum goes in there, but I think they're just picking up, and rats probably just pick up dead, you know, animals that have fallen from the roof, sort of thing. So, bat say, yeah, get one. Get a bat. <laughs> <laughs> My mate. So said where that. can we buy them? Yeah. <laughs> well, Michael Alexander from Black Snake Productions has mm. been on the show. He was mm. here the other day. He he's a demonstrator like me, mm. and he's in Victoria. He came to see Steve at Gorge and bought a couple of fruit bats. And he said, if you get some baby ones and you raise them, you can use them for educational shows. Um, I don't know. Then, then, then me and my staff have to get needles, and then I have to have a, an animal that can fly in an aviary, and I just feel bad for it. But mm. what do you think? Yeah. What I, are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I used to have an aviary, which we used to keep. I keep micro bats because I was interested in seeing how they interacted and whatever. But I always take them to talks, you know, because and I think I was talking to you earlier about little free tail bats, which... Um, you have long, narrow wings, and they normally have to climb up high to take off. So they're great. They're called scurrying bats. So you can just stick it on your shirt or run around your shirt <laughs> and not try and take off, you know. But it's absolutely, you know, in, in the... It was, it's so much harder now to take, you know, wild-caught bats along to talks to show people. Um, the authorities are really worried about diseases and all that sort of stuff, and it's a big permit ridden roll, but it's just a game-changer. Nearly everybody I show, you know, people haven't seen bats close up, and you know, and you see them, and they're like your pig, you know, like your pygmy possum or your you know, um, d- dunnarch. You know, they're just small and cute, you know, and they've got gorgeous faces. And you open the wings, and you see how finely delicate, you know, those wing membranes are, and the long, thin bones and whatever. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, the only way, you know, you pay change people's opinions really is for them to see the bats and and I guess that's what you do and what I try and do a lot of is go out and talk to groups and try and spread the word you know and I think when people see the pictures and whatever I think people are yeah by and large persuaded to like them and understand them but um but you know we who do we talk to we often talk to groups that are already interested in the environment you know so um 99.99% 99.99% of people probably won't even know what a bat is or, you know, it's difficult. They're also different too, like you talked about the different structures in their face for the sound vibrates into their face. Like, did mm. you say, was there a leaf t- leaf nose bat? Yeah, there's leaf nose and yeah. horseshoe nose bats. And, yeah, yeah. and the ghost bat has a big, you know, sort of a fleshy leaf on its face, yeah. Which is a carnivorous bat, by the way. Eats other bats and birds and whatever. I was yeah. fishing. Where was I fishing? Uh, Coffin Bay. Oh yeah. With a friend and went back to like put his boat away and everything. Saw some bats flying around, and he said, um, "Oh yeah, I've got some Hessian sacks." He just lays over in the things. He said they've all got bats in, mm. like almost like he's done it for the bats to go into. Mm. Um, which I've actually got a picture of the bats. So it's not very good for a podcast, but. Yeah, so that's a long-eared bat. Is it? Yeah. It's fairly obvious when you see its ears. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and that's a really common Pretty bat. Cool. Oh. And I, I can't tell you the number of stories I've heard of people with sheds and, and f- finding that species you know, under hessian bags or, you know, they throw their saddles over yeah. or something or other. I think John actually had the hessian bags there for the bats because yeah. he, he seemed mm. to have a lot and he's kind of controlled them in an area of his shed. Yeah. And he just sort of went and, and I went what are you doing and he grabbed one and went there it is so I made like, bat what? boxes on the strength of that so I got PVC pipe you know six inch PVC pipe about that about I don't know two feet long or so um, whatever that is and 60 centimetres or so and put a 
cap on the top and put uh, rolled up hash in and then just drilled some holes in the sub- side and support the hash in on some fencing wire. And they worked really well. I, in fact, I put them up down in the forest down in southeast at Panola. I went back after three weeks and uh, the very first, a longer bat was in there roosting in there after three weeks. Wow. How it finds these things, I don't, wow, I don't know. They've got spatial memory. They must know every new thing that happens, you know, within their... They, they must know the whole landscape really well. I went back three months later and there was a fat anikinus in that box, in that top of the... Push the hessian down, probably ate the bat yeah, and the four say. little nest oh, yeah. up the top. But, but yeah, so, you know, like James Smith's, as we were talking before, um, you know, and a lot of people now, and after the fires, there were rotary groups building nest boxes and bat boxes, and they seem to work reasonably well. So, yeah, and people who are interested in having bats you know you can find easily designs for bat boxes you know and it's something you might think about putting on a few trees down here as part of your your walks and and just see if you get bats in there um, yeah yeah so i want i yeah. want james to come to mind because i've got two of his boxes up and nothing's ever used them so mm. I, i've got them in the wrong place i know they're facing the right way but there's something mm. i've done wrong and mm. i want to get a couple of bat boxes and then james can come in and Mm. hopefully help it's a, me. it's a difficult thing you know because i think you know bat densities in in adelaide are probably fairly low um but you know with the, there's been some amazing studies on bat boxes there's a group at organ pipes national parks in victoria put out like hundreds of boxes and they've they've done, done it very um really well organized so they've had i you know the same uh, size boxes with the same entrance um, they put them on trees at the same height or in the same orientation and whatever and essentially what comes out of it is you know they'll have two boxes exactly the same the bats go in this box and stay there and none go in this for two mm. years and then other boxes they'll go in there for three months and then they move to another box sort of thing you know it's pretty random and it's a bit hard to know and there's been a lot of work been an enormous amount of work done on bat boxes to try to work out what features that uh, would be helpful for getting them, but I don't think we really know. You know, it just seems if you put up enough, some of them will be be taken up. And, mm. Yep. Giving giving him the option. Yeah, I think James may have said something about something like that when he was on the show with the bat boxes. Okay. So are many of our bat species endangered or threatened? Yeah. So um, I'm not exactly sure what the n- the number is now, um, but you know, right, maybe about ten percent. Uh, in threatened categories, uh, some uh, like the southern bentwing bats critically endangered, and others uh, endangered and others vulnerable. Um, so yeah, and there's a lot of attention paid uh, to those species. A lot of c- cool work going on, but I guess my great fear is that um, you know the cave bats are relatively easy to study. You know, so a lot of these things like ghost bats live in known caves or in mines, for example. Uh, and a lot of limestone caves, we know where there are lots of bat colonies and they're kind of relatively easy to study, but the forest bats are really difficult. You know, we've got no way of knowing. So, so at Narricourt, for example, I've got a um, colleague of mine at Humbug Scrub who is an amazing maths bof- boffin. So we've just got some funding from Zoos Victoria to count the population, which we do by recording the whole night fly out and fly into the cave and he's written this amazing software to count each bat that goes out and goes in so we you know we can get a really good idea on um uh you know how the population's trending and and what their movements are etc but forest bats are really difficult to know we've got no real idea how their populations are tracking it's just such a difficult thing to do you might be able to do it in a small area but some of these bats have large distributions like chocolate wattle bat i mentioned before and the long-eared bat we talked about it, that mm. was in the Hessian bag, you know, they're pretty much all over Australia. But we don't, you know, their population could have halved in the last 50 years and we would have no idea. Um, that this. Um, so I guess even though we do know that there's a number of bats that are threatened and people are working on those and trying to... And it's very difficult because, you know, for example, the southern bentwing bat, which has a distribution essentially from Robe in South Australia over to, um, let's say, west of, a little bit west of Geelong. And it's, we know that it's got a couple of key maternity caves and a bunch of wintering caves where they disperse. So we can, we can study that bat 
<clears throat> really well. But even even though we can study it, and it's probably one of the most studied bats, and we and we now know start to know something about its diet. We're now starting to understand its seasonal movements and its dependence on caves and all that. But what do we do with all this information? This is an area that's <clears throat> probably had ninety percent of its native vegetation cleared. You know, uh, it, you know how do we provide for that bat? And there's thirteen other microbat species that live down in the southeast as well. So how do we actually do anything about it? Um, um, the way we're approaching it is, like I said before, you know, we look at try and look at the diet throughout the year. We've only looked at the diet on one night, so we want to do that throughout the year and work out what food it's eating and and therefore try and plant things and establish habitats that will provide that food. But we just don't know anything about all the forest bats. We have no idea, you know, how they're tracking. And <clears throat> we know in certain areas. You know, large amounts of our huge trees have disappeared. The recent fires have taken out big old hollow trees on our place at Cuddly Creek. And so, yeah, I think some bats we know are endangered, and I think there are a lot more that probably are maybe not threatened, but really might be struggling, and we would never know it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, final question. Do you have a favourite bat? <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a common question. It's a Cricket really bat. yeah. I kind of really like them all, but it's a bit hard to go past the ghost bat. You know, it's I think it's one of five species in that family, and it's the biggest uh, along with that um, naked bat in Borneo is the biggest of the micro bats. And you know, this bat could quite easily jump through your fingernail. You, you know, it's got massive teeth, massive jaws. Yeah, you know, I've caught them before and they're just really placid and intelligent looking animals and just, yeah, really unique. That, yeah, I think probably my favourite. Are they called ghost bats because of the colour? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and they're very quiet, you know. Oh, okay. You watch them fly out of a mine, you just can hardly hear them, yeah. Have you ever had anything to do with vampire bats? I said that was the last question I lied, sorry. I have. Yeah. Oh, you have? Mm-hmm. Really? Because there's like three species, isn't there, of vampire That's correct. bats? Yeah. yeah, so the common vampire bat is the one that, people worry about most I, I suspect because they you know feed uh, you know on horses and seals and you know if you see if you're going to swag and got your toe out the end you know they can feed on you feed on humans and because they have to drink blood every night don't they uh you probably know more than i do i think they have to they right. have to drink regularly and okay. um yeah and they they can eat almost their body weight and and they when they take off they just sort of launch like a harrier jet yeah, to get right. into the air and like fly dracula yeah, like Dracula, yeah. But one's a, a bird specialist on birds, bird blood. Ugh. And uh, I was re- reading a story or listening to a biologist talk about this. He was, he was explaining how he was watching this bird about the size of a chicken asleep at night on a branch, <sighs> and all these little, tiny little vampire bats came in, you know, nicked the a vessel, on, blood vessel on the toe. And over the course of an hour or so, he watched this, these bats come in and lap up the blood, and, the, and apparently the bird just fell off the branch in shock. Oh, my they God. Just lost that much blood so how rude mm. um so i've got, I've got <laughs> one other thing to say yeah hammerhead bat ah oh, yeah well now we're talking different league yeah different league of bats Hit, just happened. Hit, I think you. monstrosus i was, I was yeah. gonna say monstrosus that. Like, definitely no, uh pretty weird looking bat it's, it's sh- the, like a horse head i'm just trying oh to find i Adrian. have seen that i've Let's seen pictures off. yeah wow yeah it looks like a gargoyle Oh, there's, and that's there's a, just so many. That's a fruit bat, isn't it? Mm. The yeah, I think bat? it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but I was thinking, just as you think, look up um, the lacewing bat or Centurio senex. This is a bat that's got the oh, face. Look, it's like it's hit a car window at 120 <laughs> kilometres. What's it an called? Uh, lacewing uh, bat. Lacewing. How'd you spell bat? <laughs> <laughs> It's like bad, but you swap the D for a T. Swing. <laughs> I can give you this. Come up with lace wing things. No, it was probably it? better to write in Centurio. That's, and it has this kind of weird, it's un, no doubt the ugliest bat in the universe. It's just got this <laughs> horrible skin on its face and these flaps that... So we've gone from our favourite bat to our oh least favourite bat. Oh, my good lord. <laughs> Chocolate waddle bat. Yeah, it's got these beautiful wings. Oh, it does look like it's flying into the back of a bus. That, yeah, that, and apparently it closes those... Sure it didn't? 
Apparently, somebody told me that those they those flaps on the see. on the Bubbit's brow <laughs> fold down and match up with its chin. I think it's to hide its face in shame. Uh, oh, I would but, think so. Look at that. Wow. That's, but it's got beautiful wings. You know, Look at it go. These beautiful lace wings. It doesn't so. matter. You're never going to see the wings past that face, are you? Mm. And did you say just? And I'm going to go right back to the beginning now. And I did say this is the last question. You said they um, <laughs> separate their ossicles from their eardrum so they don't. Yeah, so only hear their echo yeah. and the call they, they're sending and out like this back and forward it, oh so, so yeah weird. so it's very fast muscle movement it's like i think it's 200 a second or something or other they can do this Man, that's a so crazy just, just decouple yeah the, so they can hear that is, above so the bizarre. that is so bizarre um wow thank you so much for coming on terry no um, fun. And, awesome yeah. yes thank you i'm gonna thank joan again too Last week's episode. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Last week's episode. Like we bring one out every week. Yeah, I was going to um, say, don't get people's hopes up to weekly. Jeez. Oh, man. Thank you for having us. Oh, that you was a pleasure. More than welcome. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you thank for you. all your knowledge. That was amazing. That was amazing. And thank you for all you do. Mm. Yeah. Oh. And uh, to you guys. Likewise. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. And guys, thank you for listening. <laughs>